Hello. Welcome to all my combo lords joining me there today. Today, we're going to do a little bonus stream like we do a few days each week to look at some more fun facts that didn't make it into my last combo class episode. To anybody who hasn't seen that, I do have linked in the description an episode I dropped last night. So you should make sure to check that out later, but I won't spoil the crucial details of that episode today. We can just talk about the overall concept or branch of math that it's within, and some other fun facts that aren't going to necessarily relate to graph theory. But part of today's topic will be about that because I've gone down a little rabbit hole of studying that for fun. It's not my original main expertise. I know a little more about things like number theory than in particular what's called graph theory here, although of course there are connections. And graph theory has a lot of fun little things that I wanted to tuck into the last episode, but I couldn't. It was already almost 20 minutes to explain our core concept of one question in graph theory called Ramsey numbers. and. The cool thing about graph theory, not only is that it, there's a lot of open questions in unsolved math, but that we get to make little pictures to help ourselves visualize it. And sometimes those pictures even get funny nicknames. And a lot of the little graphs are given a name based on what one way of assembling the dots and drawing the connections looks like. Now, when we say graph theory in this context, we do not mean like a xy coordinate plane desmos graph we mean like which ways can a set of points be connected and often if you say graph it's short for what's called a simple graph where what that means is that we don't get any connections that are a point to itself and we don't get any double connections and it's also going to be undirected meaning that the connections don't have a direction that matters. So all these are things we won't be including, but they are technically types of graph, but often graph for short will stand for one of these simple undirected ones. I got a set of points, which sometimes are actually called points. Like, you know, they can be called vertices in this context. They can be called nodes. Uh, they can be called points. And then we can have our connections between them. And the way that I visualized it last main episode is we had two colors and we connected all of the points to each other, which is called a complete graph when it's, they're all connected. But we did it with two colors. Secretly though, that's the same question or math behind saying I get to connect some of the points and I only have one color. Or, I mean, I could connect some or all or none of the points, and I have one color. Because I can imagine all the unused connections here are the other color. So, like, if that's the graph I'm talking about, I have four points, four nodes, and there are three in a triangle and one connected to none. I could say that, oh, it's also standing for the bicolor complete graph. And I have two colors, but they're all connected. Sort of like I'm drawing on the not theirs. Now, that makes it easier in some contexts to visualize. There's pure math behind all of these structures, but it's a lot easier to make pictures to visualize them or analogies about life. Like these are people with a certain relationship that they do or don't have as pairs. And with these little pictures, although it was a lot easier to look at it with two colors for the episode, some of what we're going to see now is just the one color, the on connections there. What are ways that I could connect four dots? And if there should be 11, because there was 11 ways total, distinct ways that can't be moved around to secretly be one of each other. When I did the two colors for 11 in the episode that I drew, should be the same thing if I have one color and I'm only drawing the ons. So let's see, what would the 11 possibilities be? You have none of the four are connected. You have all of them. We're gonna try and draw them like them and their dual image, the one that's flipped colors. All the ons turn to offs. Sometimes they come in pairs. Although the fact that there was 11 total tells us one was its own reflection. So then we could have 
one connected or we could have all but one connected. Now, we're going to assume that you could drag the dots wherever you want and if it turns into one of the shapes we've already had, we don't need to add a new one if it can be dragged around into one of these. So, for example, here when we say one of the graphs could also be, um, let's see, duh, 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 duh. we could also have like um, a C-like, we could have a C-like shape here. This would be the same graph as like da 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 because it's still like or yeah because it's still just like four in a line and then you have some other pairs that aren't connected that if we redrag the vertices of that Z we could make the C now the reverse of the C would be everything except what the C has going on so like that and then there's a few more now I could draw them all but I actually have a link here that will look at little pictures of how they chose to unwind them. I find it easy when you have a small amount of dots to draw them all like squares because you can see the relationships that way. But here when you get to more dots, it's not always the easiest to visualize to put them as if they're almost like vertices on a polygon. Like it doesn't have to be that way, but if you spread them equidistant on an invisible circle, it makes a square shape for four, it makes a pentagon for five. That's, as a rule of thumb, would be the easiest way to probably see all the connections in many cases. But here they sort of unwind them into other shapes. And when it gets unwound into a shape that looks like a small enough graph that it's used a bunch or referenced a bunch, and simple enough that it looks like a little thing, it gets a nickname sometimes. And first let's just look at one that I may have looked at part of here before, which is all of the graphs drawn sort of this way, but not all in squares, all put the way that's easier for them to be. So like here we have, there are four distinct ways that three could be connected. We could have none, one, two, or three. And any can be unwound into those. When we get to four, we start getting more options because we could have like, this is everything except one linked, and this is one linked. They're putting them with the dual, like I was. Here we have this one that's nicknamed the co-paw and the paw. So here we start getting some nicknames. This one they say is called the paw or the three pan. And uh, here you got your diamond, your co-diamond. These ones don't get nicknames, but there's terms for them. They all have, um, like structural ones too, or like this is K22. The claw and the co-claw. So you got your claw and you got your paw. Your different structures and your co-claw. And this is self-complementary. This means that if I did everything except what's happening here, it would actually secretly be the same thing. It would be like, da, 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 da. they would like be in a line of the other four that aren't touching. So, if I flip the colors here, essentially, and it was two colored and complete, it would be the same or it could be unwound and did the same. So there are also, you know, more purely mathematical ways to say these are the only 11. Any other can be unwound into one of these. But you can kind of imagine it like if I dragged around the dots, but the connections stayed, can I turn any connection web into one of these. Yeah, they can all turn into one of these 11. But here's where we get big. Well, let's also even think, if we cared about which ones were which, if we were like, okay, we're gonna call the dots A, B, C, and D, and it matters like, is A connected to D in particular, not just what the web looks like, then there'd be far more. There would be, um, out of four points, there are, the complete graph ends up having the third triangular number amount of links because it has three from one, two more from another, and one more from another. So it ends up having three plus two plus one links for this. And then five dots would have the fourth triangular number amount of links. If I cared which order they were, each one can be on or off and it would be two to that power. So it would be two to the sixth power amount of these, 
but then there would be two to the 10th power amount of five dot ones, two to the 15th power amount of 16 or six dot ones. Luckily, we're gonna be like, let's assume that we're good at unwinding one into another and we're only talking about distinct ones that cannot be unwound. Uh, well, that sort of limits it, but it still grows really quick. Here you got 34 vertices and so on. Now, if we wanna see the list of more of these, let's see how a good resource is this site called the OEIS. Let me pull that up, which is the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. And I, I've seen that they have the sequence before, but I don't know which sequence it is and I can find it very easily because I know the first few terms. I know that there were four, it doesn't have to start with the first term. There were four somewhere in there for the third one. Uh, then it went 11, then 34, and bam, number of graphs on N unlabeled nodes. So this is a chart I showed in the episode. I mean, I just showed a few stats of a few of them. Uh, it was, I showed, uh, I already discussed that it goes up to 34, then 156. So I was like, all right, let's show a few more. Let's show seven, eight, nine, and 10. And then I wanted to go a little further, but I, I only had so much room on the screen. So I was like, let's jump to 20 and show that. And I had to like change the font. Well, okay, this list cuts off at 19, but you can get longer lists here, table of up through 87. And so I had to change the font size to fit 20 on the episode. And then I was gonna put 30. And I was like, okay, I'm just gonna count how many digits are in 30 and just say how many digits were in the number. And it's exactly 99 digits. I double checked it. I was like, oh, nice. That's a nice round amount. A 99 digit number when we see 30. And that's only the distinct ones. Like I showed here, I'm pretty sure this was just my own little calculation, I just thought. But I think if we cared which point was which and like every single way I could color this a square, if it mattered A, B, C versus D, then I think it would be two to the power of the 29th triangular number. But that, that was just a quick thought. I don't know. Leave a comment if you think that is the accurate formula. Uh, overall here, the distinct ones still grow really quick. And this is why the number that we are uh, trying to prove something about in the episode, not that I'm trying to prove something in the episode, but that I'm discussing mathematical proofs about, uh, would have to check sort of this size range, these types of numbers, amount of distinct graphs if they did it with brute force. And so, yeah, a computer is not going to do that. A computer is not going to be able to check this many of those. Maybe someday, maybe some alien has a computer that can do that, but it's going to be a pretty big, powerful computer. <laughs> now, let's see... Um, let me take a peek at our comments. Thank you. Um, sorry to those who don't like when I live stream. This right now for me is the afternoon. So it's going to be at different times. I do like incorporating different times a day for different time zones. But the times I'm going to live stream are, will be typically in my afternoon or early evening. And so... I'm in Pacific time, and that's what we get. If you can't see the live streams live, you can always watch them after the fact, especially if you wait about half a day. Then you get, not only I will have put in some timestamps of different parts, but the HD version will have processed, and the chat will have processed to appear. Now, someone's saying, are they like exponents but on the bottom? I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. Um, what I was saying right here, two to the power of that, that was just a normal exponent. So like, you know, two to the power of something large. You do have to be careful of something that has similar terms that makes people up as if I'm like, okay, we're gonna talk about powers of three. Or if I'm like, okay, we're gonna talk about third powers. At a quick listen, those might sound like the same thing, but they're not at all. Third powers and powers of three are saying the set of numbers that are x to the third or the set of numbers that are three to the x. 
they only line up like once, basically. They only line up when um, we're at three to the three and three to the three. Apart from that, it's um, third powers are cubes. Powers of three are like, you know, a lot of them aren't cubes. You get, you get three, nine, 27, 81 and stuff. So be careful. It, if you hear like powers of five versus fifth powers, almost always different. They're only the same if it's the fifth power. So somebody said they found another overkill base, base 120. Now, although it's overkill for a numeral base, 120 is one of the greatest numbers of all time. The long hundred. Uh, in fact, sometimes historically was just called the hundred, but we're gonna assume that we can't get away with calling it the hundred that, you know, one zero zero has taken that spot, unfortunately. We can, however, bring back the term long hundred, which it was used as for a while. So remember that your long hundreds are far more useful than your hundreds. One hundreds way less divisible in, you know, whether we're talking about what types of things it can divide or how many things it can divide than 120. 120 also is five factorial. So happens to be the amount of ways I could arrange five items. And it's also a triangular number. I think it might even be a tetrahedral number too, or it's either triangular or tetrahedral or maybe both. 120, amazing number. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if we have an episode dedicated to the long hundred sometime. One of my first episodes was about highly composite numbers, which that is. And so that was an example of the better hundred. Now, here on our graph theory thoughts, these are all of the massive amounts of things we could check, but looking at some smaller ones, I also wanted to show some cool little nicknames that some of them get about different families they're in. Sometimes the math nicknames come in like combos or webs, and when you read one of their nicknames, it's explained through another nickname like when I first read about what's called weird numbers, which is a type of number, the smallest of which is 70. Um, it was defined as numbers that are semi -per abundant, but not semi-perfect. And I'm like, whoa, reading one nickname made me get two more nicknames I got to dive into. So here's an example of that. There's a type of graph called the caterpillar tree. And one definition of what a caterpillar tree is, is a caterpillar is a tree which metamorphosizes into a path when its cocoon of endpoints is removed. Now, while that's a more casual definition, the, we can see that they do have definitions for what's called trees in graphs. They have definition for what's called leaves. And they nicknamed this one a caterpillar, not just because some of them look kind of caterpillar-like, but because it like works with the other web of nicknames of them. Caterpillar trees are trees for when you remove the leaves, this happens, or things like that. How many paths are on the leaf? So that is pretty cool. And other examples of nicknames here that we're going to go through are like, well, here we can see there's a lobster graph. That's a type of tree. And there are many wild nicknames. Here's just a few of them are graph families. We got our trees. We got leaf power. So the leaf power of a tree is something you can measure. You got a linear forest. You got a lot of fun nicknames. We've got cactus graphs. Cactus graphs are connected graphs with any two, which any two simple cycles, which cycles are when you can go around a little path in it, kinda, and have at most one vertex in common. Now we got, what are some other fun ones? A pseudo forest. We have 
there's a lot that are named after like plants and animals. Like the other one that aren't on here, there's like one called the banana tree graph and a lot of fun ones like that. Those are just, uh, they didn't have all the wildest nicknames here. Let's look at some of the families here where they got more complete pictures. Lists of graphs. So these are some graphs that have been notable in different mathematical proofs or contexts. You got your butterflies, your diamonds, and some more complicated ones. <laughs> Pretty neat. Remember that any of these, we could drag the dots wherever we want, and it would be considered the same graph as long as we maintain the connections. But these turn out to be the easiest ways to draw them, or a good way to draw them to use in a certain proof or context. These graphs are dense. These graphs got a lot of points going on. Those are wild. Here we got some more fun ones. Some of these represent webs uh, that describe other types of shapes too. We can look at graphs that look like the shadow a hypercube would have. Here's our complete graphs. And we could see what I was saying about how the amount of things in them is a triangular number. You have like one connection, one plus two connections, one plus two plus three. And it's because you could say like, there's one different one to come out. No more to come out from that, it's covered. Two to come out from there. One that hasn't been done coming from there, all covered. Three coming out from there. Two that haven't been done, one that hasn't been done, all covered. That's why I was thinking that if we cared about which corner was which, and we looked at all of the ways to have them on or off, there would be two to the power of that because it's that many on or offs times each other as different options. Like here, if I could have any of these on or off and I cared which they were, it's gonna be two options there times two options there times two options there total. So that'll get even bigger than those numbers of uh, distinct graphs we saw. Um, th one of these is a shape that came up in one of my things. I have a popular short that's going over a classic math thing where there's a sequence that goes 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 31. And it's the amount of maximal areas we can create by making dots like this if there was a circle also with areas for them. And people thought it had to be this complete graph. So a lot of comments are like, no, there's only 30. You drew it wrong, but it didn't have to be lined up like this. You can make it 31 if you drag it over a little bit. You got an extra little triangle thing in the middle. Well, maybe not triangle, but a little shape. Here are ones called utility graphs. These are ones just called cycles. Ooh, these are called friendship graphs. Ooh, these look pretty cool. These are the graphs similar to the platonic solids. It's like a cube skeleton, octahedron. Now, here we can say hypercube graphs are the ones that I mentioned. They have, what does it look like if I'm a 4D cube and I try and look at the relationship of the vertices? I can flatten it however I want. I just care about how things are connected. So, although graph theory is easy to draw with shapes, you often end up with a number for your answer because it's often counting how many of a certain thing there is. So a lot of the questions or answers in graph theory turn out to be a whole number because it's like how many connections there are. Can't, I can't be, have half a connection under the rules I set. And once in a while, there's even a really cool thing where you have a formula that you know is supposed to tell you the answer of something like this. And you know that formula must always simplify to an integer because you know the answer to the question wouldn't make sense as a half number. So we will go into more graph theory apart from, like I said, make sure after the stream you see, uh, if you haven't yet, linked in the description, the new episode about this thing called Ramsey numbers in graph theory that I made. We're also gonna look at some other ones such as a classic one called the four color map theorem can be drawn as graphs and explained, you know, with help from graphs of this sort. And the four color map theorem is controversial to a degree because 
the five color case was proved by humans. And then the four color case was proved with the help of a computer checking an absurd amount of things. Like it needed a human to tell it which things to check. And it, it was entirely based on human creativity, but they had a computer run so many things that a human can't check them all. And so it's like, do we trust the computer that we've proven the four color case? It was sort of controversial in mathematics, like a precursor to the whole like, what if AI solves a proof? How many different types of AI would have to say the things correct before we fully trust it? Or, you know, when, what does it mean to trust a AI? What would it take to trust it's a proof from that as much as a proof that like 20 mathematician humans agreed on? We're not nearly there. Do not trust if AI tells you it has a proof. AI thinks it could prove whatever. And it is absolutely not going to be the one solving the Riemann hypothesis anytime soon, at least. Now, you never know about the future, but <laughs> I do think I'm probably at some point going to, since I've been occasionally using the chat GPT, the newest free version, and sort of roasting how bad it still is, is we're going to be... Um, I'll probably try and buy the 4.0 just for one month to see whether it's improved or not. Um, and so maybe for one month, I'll buy the newer, ver the newest version to probably end up demonstrating it still has a lot of flaws, but they have worked with Wolfram more, which is a more trustworthy thing. So maybe that combo helped them. Um, somebody is wondering, uh, how do I have so many subs, but so few views? Yeah, YouTube doesn't promote the streams to like anyone. So barely anyone sees the streams on their front page for some reason. So that's okay. I have fun doing the streams and I like making bonus content. But it is funny how much more views a video I put out will get than a stream I do. So part of why I do so many streams is because I do... I'm currently doing like all the combo class editing for both of my channels and I can only do so much of that. So a lot of my ideas I have to do in a more free form stream form that I won't have to edit. But as I get more help on my team and work with more people and stuff in the future and have other people's editing help involved, then more of my stream ideas I'll be able to put out as videos and stuff, which YouTube does like a lot more. They do not like promoting the streams to that many people for some reason. So let's see. Um, somebody said 87 over 29 is a whole number. What the fuck? Well, we can know that'll be the case because eight plus seven adds to 15 and that's Thrieven. So I want everyone to get in their head that you can eliminate a huge batch of potential primes from your head by checking does the digits add to a Thrieven number. And so I made an episode relatively recently about how if you run the Thrieven test and the almost instant two and five test, then the only numbers under a hundred that will trick you and sneak by that everything else will either trigger that test, be prime or be seven squared, seven times 11 or the sneaky 91. Um, so somebody said they joined the stream and watched the whole thing at twice speed to keep up. Now it feels slow. That's funny. So I can start talking really fast. Now I can keep up and then everyone can slow it down and then we can get twice the stream and then you can slow it down and watch it in slow-mo. No. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, people like watching on different speeds. I don't really watch YouTube ever on other speeds that much. I usually just watch it while I'm doing something else when I'm watching something that's slower paced. Now, Somebody noted they got alerted for the stream because they put on notifications. I don't know if that's always the case. It alerts people when the stream processes as a video later, but I don't know if it always tells people when the stream starts. I don't know. I often say in the Discord when a stream's about to happen. So you can always join the Combo Class Discord if you want to be more often notified of stuff like that. Somebody asked, what's the most important number sequence? Well, I mean, we could call the natural numbers a number sequence, and those are pretty important. But apart, and I mean, we could call the even numbers a number sequence or things like that. 
So there's a lot of simple ones that are technically very important. Some of the ones we would have to shout out for some of the most important number sequences would be um, just a bunch of the classics are triangular numbers, square numbers, perfect powers, highly composite numbers, um, factorials. Um, there's a lot, those are some of the classics. Fibonacci sequence. Uh, one that we've discussed a bit, but I haven't made a full episode about yet, is Euler's totient function. That's a pretty important one. Somebody mentioned a primorial randomly in a comment. That's another fun number sequence. Now, I do have actually some other fun numbery stuff I want to share too, which is a fun thing related to some random factors I was experimenting with, which is more number theory e than graphy. But let's look at a few more graphs from one other place. Here we have simple graph on Wolfram MathWorld, which is kind of a Wikipedia-like sector of there. And here we can see a picture of like a bunch of different options for them. So here's another drawing where they put them more in squares like I did. So like if they're in a square, these are the 11 fours that you could have. And we could see uh, if anyone's curious and wants to read this later, there are formulas to enumerate how many distinct graphs there are, but it's not simple. It, the, you know, I said if we cared about which was which, it might be just like two to the power of a triangular number. Uh, when we look at just distinct ones, we have a lot more mathematical work if you want to figure out why there was 11 right there. Here are some more neat pictures of different types, some different families. These are kind of cool as you see like families of graph grow because it's like, okay, cycle graph. These are ones that just like dun, 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 sort of expand only on the edges. You get gear graph are ones that look like gears or like wheels sort of. You got matchstick graphs. So a lot of fun types. Oh, here, this is a bunch more nicknames. You get your forks, your darts, your bulls, your diamonds, your houses, your kites. Your tadpoles, your gems, your crickets. Uh, butterfly got glitched. Butterfly graph. Um, so those are fun. A lot of those. Ooh, even more. Whoa, look at all these types of graphs. Ladder graphs, pan graphs. Ooh, we were talking about these the other day. Polyominoes are so cool. I actually had them out the other day. I'm going to get back out polyominoes. I'm going to save this for another day because we're going to look at tiling the plane with a few of these for when I make an episode soon, doing a more thorough explanation of the history leading up to all those new mathematical discoveries about aperiodic monotiles. So that will be one of the upcoming episodes will be the last stream I did was like, whoa, look, they just found new news about an upgrade to the aperiodic monotile thingy they found. We will do that in episode form where I go into a more clear explanation and visual examples and stuff. And it's also going to include the lead up to that, like things called Penrose tiles and stuff. That will probably be one of our next episodes. During this month, I'm not going to promise exactly what days episodes are coming out, but there are some slightly bigger scale fun ones I have planned for the Combo Class channel, so I wouldn't be surprised if some of the episodes there are slightly over a week apart, but are a little longer and extra full of rare stuff. And on this channel as well, uh, hard to say what will come. I have been putting out shorts as well that I haven't been notifying or putting to subscription feeds but I've been linking in videos like this. So that's another thing to make sure you've seen if you care for that type of content, not everyone does, is linked in this description. I have some of the ones I've been putting on the Combo Class channel, which needs help on those shorts. It, the shorts algorithm only likes you once you've been posting on it a lot from that specific channel. So the Combo Class channel's shorts uh, need some help compared to this channel. This channel, I can put out like a dumb short and it'll get a million views, but Combo Class Channel needs more of all of our combo lords to uh, make sure they catch that content too. And yes, a lot of people have said that I look like Jack Harlow before. We have covered that before, but 
I will say again, I will rap battle him when someone sets it up and I will win. That is not a joke. Now, thank you all for joining me and leaving all of your thoughts. We will jump back into more graph theory questions over time, and I'm going to leave these up. But in a moment, I'm going to transition to another fun thing about numbers I've been playing around with, which is another little game that I thought, hmm, what can we go down the rabbit hole of this to discover related to factors of numbers? And it's pretty simple, and I haven't spent much time thinking about it. But I came to one interesting conclusion so far that I thought was worth sharing. And what we'll look at here is we're going to look at numbers, factors, but we're going to divide them like their little sandwich. Now, this isn't what I was saying when I said it. I was working with something called sandwich numbers or what I called that the other day. That's still coming. My sandwich numbers are a technique to make really big numbers. So that'll show up when we do like Googleology and stuff. But we're still using a sandwich analogy here. Let's say that a number's factors, let's use like uh, the number 36. So the factors of 36 are one, two, three, four, six, um, nine, 12, 18 and itself. Now, we can sort of divide these up a bit. First, we can say that all numbers bigger than one, well, all whole numbers we'll be talking about here, bigger than one, have one and themselves separately. So let's say those are like the bread of our sandwich. Now, sometimes you have all the other factors mostly come in pairs, but sometimes if it's a square number, then you will have, I mean, in any time it's a square number. So in the circumstance, if and only if it's a square number, we'll have a middle factor as well that pairs up with itself to multiply it to the number. So in this case, we sort of have a middle thing too. So here we got like, if these are ingredients inside and these are our bread-like layers, we got like a crunch wrap supreme from Taco Bell right there with that little thing in the middle of the crunch wrap supreme or like one of those uh, a Big Mac where they put the piece of bread in the middle of the burger, you know? So, you can use your food analogy here, a club sandwich whatever. Sometimes you get a middle piece of bread, we'll call it, in our sandwich. Your middle factor. Not always, it's only if it's square number. Then it, Apart from that, we could say that we have these two batches of factors. We got our lower inner factors and our upper inner factors. So what I was wondering is, given that these are pretty paired up, how much data could we get about the number itself if we just had the lower section of factors? And for now, it, there were two ways I was thinking about it. We could go not you don't need to include one because you know it has one as a factor. You can include one or start there. You know there's a one. But we'll say we're including the middle piece of bread when there is one. And we'll also say, what if you were given this list and you didn't know if this was the middle piece of bread or not? So we're going to be given a list of all of a number's factors that are bigger than one but not bigger than the number's square root. And that'll cover either, you know, half of the factors once we fill in the one we know about, or a little more than half of the factors if it's a square number. So here's the interesting thing I noticed when I thought of that, is that if I'm given just that it has a factor of two and that that is the biggest factor that's not bigger than the square root of the number. Well, then I know that we have one, two, and we must have some other prime here that's bigger than the square root that pairs up with two to make the number. P, and then the number itself is 
twice P. That equals the number, whatever that prime is. So there's an infinite family of numbers that if I was given the sandwich, not including the upper half or top is just one and two, which we're going to say we were just given the two because we assume the one. Then there's an infinite family of numbers like six works, one, two, three, six. Three and six are bigger than that, the square root. Uh, one, two, five, ten. One, two, seven, fourteen. So there's an infinite family of numbers that fits that. But what if I get that the lower portion contains two and three, and that's all it has? So now we know that one, two, and three are all we have up to the square root of the size of the number. Well, we know that six must be a factor in here too, because if the number can divide two and can divide three, it can divide six. So six is somewhere over here. It's not necessarily the next one, but there is a six somewhere in there. Now, the six must be paired up with one of these. The six can't be paired up with the two because then we would have to deal with three times itself. Well, no, the six can be paired up with the two if we fill in something lower than it. The six must be paired up, or yeah, the six can't be paired up with itself. That would be too big because then we would have all the, if it's 36, there's way more factors that would have had to be included. If the six paired up with the one, the three is too big. So the six must be paired up with the two or the three. If the six is paired up with the two, then that makes 12 the number. And if the six is paired up with the three, well, and then we fill in four is the other factor. So 12 does work here because the number 12, if we were given just that portion of the sandwich, it would be just one, two, three, or what we would call the lower inner fillings, including the crunch wrap layer, if you got that middle, uh, would be two and three in that case. The other option was if it's paired up with the three, then we get 18 as another one that works. Then we have a nine paired up with the two. However, from as far as my quick thinking through this, those should be the only possible solutions. Those two numbers, 12 and 18, I believe are the only numbers whose lower up to and or including middle factors are one, two, and three with nothing else. So the fact that one, two had an infinite family of numbers that worked for it. And one, two, three was weirdly more restrictive and only had two numbers it could describe. Made me wonder, what else can I fiddle around with and find there? What For a given start, what types of number are with that start? Are there three digit starts down there that have an infinite family? Maybe not, maybe every three digit start is required to have a finite amount due to how they combine. And I was thinking about other options of generalizing it. Like if we say, I have one, P is a prime, and then Q is a prime. So in the case that what I know is that up to and or including the middle is one, and then two separate primes, then we can deduce things like we must have P times Q as another factor. And we can only have up to three other factors because we've been given the bottom half. And so the P times Q, we also need the number over P and the number over Q, meaning I believe that P times Q has to be the same as either the number over P or the number over Q. Now I thought through all of that pretty quickly, but I think that m led to the conclusion that if you're given one prime prime, and that's up to and including the middle, that you should only have up to two solutions possible. But it's interesting that you get two, that there's like a friendship. What about if you have four? Are there families of numbers or pairs of numbers? Or if you're given four things, are you always stuck in a single number? 
Well, we can backtrack it and we can look at what is the table of divisors and look at cutting them off up to a certain point and see, okay, we're gonna see if we find any matches just that way from, you know, more of a brute force little test of the first few. And we could see like one, two. Oh, I forgot one, two can also include this number, can also include four because if we say it could be up to and or including the uh, middle slice, then one, two could be this infinite family or it could be the number four, which is sort of like that if P was the same prime two. Here, we can note that if we're ever given an empty or just with the number one, it's a prime unless we were just given lower than the square root, in which case a square of a prime. So here, a number like nine would depend on if we tell ourselves that middle factor and whether we tell ourselves the middle factor is a middle factor that's paired with itself. Because if not, just being given one three, uh, nine isn't the only answer. We could imagine an infinite family like 15 will do that too. One, three, five, 15, the lower portions one and three. Here we could see 12 as the one, two, three I was talking about. And that like, there's a bunch that start with one, two, an infinite family. Here we could see like 20 starts with one, two, four. So does 16, if we include the middle. As far as I can quickly calculate, you know, those should be the only two that can start like that. So it's kind of interesting that they're like paired up with a friend when you have three. So I was wondering, you know, when you have four, one, two, three, four makes 24. I think that's the only one that could be 24. I don't think, cause we need to have combos of these as factors. So we basically need six, eight and 12 up there. So one, two, three, four as a start would definitely tell us the number is 24. So in some cases being told the lower sector of the factors tells you exactly what the number is, but not in every case. Is it in every case for when there's more than two that you're given? So that was just a real quick numerical experiment. I thought of the last time that I showed a numerical experiment on stream. Um, I did get an email or two about data about it. So I still have to get back to people about that. Sorry if I've gotten your emails and haven't gotten back. I will look through those this weekend. But similarly, if anybody wants to, has any ideas of proving that uh, certain traits always guarantee a single number for if you have a certain amount at the beginning uh, versus which types guarantee families or which types guarantee pairs. If you have any thoughts or proofs about that, or any data you gather, let me know. I find it interesting that for a lot of numbers, if we describe just the lower half, we know exactly what the number is, but not always. So just a random thought I had. Uh, that was one of the other ones I wanted to tuck into today's stream because there's many little random experiments I've done over my life and still do that they're stacking up quicker than I'm making them into episodes. So I better start throwing some onto this bonus channel as well. Remember, this is my bonus channel, despite having more subscribers, still my more, you know, free form channel. But so sometimes it gets the scraps from the combo class channel, but there's going to be uh, more personal investigations and experiments that I'll throw onto this channel. Like I do at times, or I do often in the streams, I'll start making little bonus videos out of them at times too. And then we'll see if I ever get enough cool proofs or data to turn those into combo class episodes. So, um, and the reason I first thought about this was thinking about an interesting other little thought that crossed my head was like, let's say I have the factors of a number, like here was 36. And let's say I, divide, um, there's different ways of defining these as the number over the bottom half. So like, what if I said the factors were like one, two, three, four, and then we get like 36 over six is sort of a middle anomaly. And then we get like 36 over four is a factor. 
36 over 3 is a factor, 36 over 2 is a factor, and 36 over 1 is a factor. So it's sort of like, you know, if you divide by the number on the upper stretch of it, then you get some symmetry. And part of why I thought this was because we've been looking at when symmetric patterns emerge in things. And here we can see that if I allow myself to be like, okay, at some point we're going to flip, but I'm just going to talk about the denominator for a minute, then it's symmetrical. One, two, three, four, six, four, three, two, one. So maybe that will get a mention when we do a combo class episode I mentioned about various types of symmetry that showed up, such as why the quadratic residues were symmetrical, why certain types of continued fraction look, get symmetrical, stuff like that, like number factors. Somebody said, what is the name of another channel? If you mean my other channel, uh, it's called Combo Class. In fact, I still have this one called Demotro from Combo Class to hopefully guide more people toward that. Eventually, I might just call this channel Demotro, but that is my main channel in a way because that's where every one to sometimes two weeks, I put out a fully thought through, spent a lot of time editing and filming, a lot of different scenes and facts episode. And so I consider those my episodes of my show. And this is more like, hey, what else is the guy who makes the episodes up to? But of course, there's plenty to teach. And so when I'm gonna live stream, sometimes it's more chatty, sometimes it's more philosophical, but I usually try and tuck in a few facts because there's more than enough that won't fit on that channel. So a lot of my live streams, for example, here are a one or two math topics and then it devolves to the point we're at now where i've covered most of the math topics i wanted to instantly cover there's one or two more number facts i want to share about just a few specific numbers but mostly we are getting to you know when we start taking a peek at the nature around here talking about philosophy chatting about upcoming goals and you know uh, rare memories and things like that seeing playing around with science equipment so uh, make sure that you are extra tuned in to that channel compared to this one. This one is fun, but that one is extra important. Now, speaking of all the nature around here, the front yard is blooming pretty crazy and we're going to get a lot of fruits soon. I'm going to have a lot of apples to deal with. There's a few different fruit trees in the front yard, but we share the front yard with some neighbors and my family and most of the fruit trees, it's like, you're gonna eat all the fruit on them. You get a bunch of fruit, it's really cool, but you're gonna eat it all. The apple trees though, there's four apple trees, maybe five even, that have more apples than I know what to do with. So I'm like giving away apples, we're putting apples on the street, I'm making applesauce, I'm finding experiments to do. So leave a comment if you have any interesting science experiments you'd like to see if in a month there is a more elevated sequel to an Apple science episode I made last year, well, I filmed it last year, it probably came out less than a year ago on the Combo Class channel, that while we did a little Apple science snack break, I feel like we can take it to another level because I'm gonna have so many apples. You know, there's a trope about teachers getting an apple on their desk or if like the student wants to suck up to the teacher so they bring them an apple or something. Don't bring me an apple. I'm going to have enough. <laughs> so <laughs> in any case, one type of number I did want to talk about, which is also just a little thankful thing, is I like being appreciative and aware of which numbers have been hit when we pass more and more amounts of Combo Lords subscribed here, a lot of which came from shorts, such as a lot of people liked my really simple multiply by 11 short recently. But... Uh, hopefully the shorts viewers join us down the combo rabbit hole by getting sucked into the fun madness through a stream or episode. But we have passed 140,000, which is so cool. It was about on Pi Day that we passed 100,000. So that means that in two and a half months, we've done another 40,000. So cool. Love you all so much, which is really, really cool. And uh, know there is a Discord if you want to chat around with more combo lords. And if you're really helpful, there is a Patreon too, if you want to help me do this stuff. And the number that we passed, 140,000, is not necessarily that crucial of a number. 
It's 14 with a bunch of zeros after it. Has a bunch of twos and fives in it and a seven in it. It's not even three even. 140,000. So even. So feeven. Little bit seven. Not even three even. Uh, but there was another number that I saw this thing about that apparently 140,800 had an interesting trait. So let's see if we can find that on which sequence it was in in the OEIS. It related to how many, a bunch of bases it does this one trait. So, oh man, unfortunately it's in a few of them here. Um, here, this is what it was. They called this thing a Ronda number. A number is a Ronda number if in a base B, the product of its digits when written in base B is equal to that number B times the sum of its prime factors. With multiplicity means that you include the prime factors more than once if there's multiples. Here, oh sorry, I didn't have it, here it is. So with multiplicity. Um, now, so for example, that means that like the prime factors of this, if I add them all up and multiply it by some base, then that's equal to this number written in that base and all of its digits multiplied together. Kind of random seeming trait, but the cool thing about this number is it's not just a number that does that in a base. It is the smallest number that does that in, let's see, how many bases? In, um, what? This looks different. What's going on here? Why is this out of order or something? That's weird. Um, wait, they are, oh yeah, in exactly. So I was thinking it would be like in at least, but this is in exactly. Okay, the smallest number that, that's why I can go down, because you can have to be exactly there. So the smallest number that in exactly eight bases, it does that thing, where it, in that base, if you add its prime factors and multiply it by the base number, it equals the product of the digits of this when written in that base. So maybe that makes this number even cooler than 140,000 on its own. The next numerical special of a subscriber amount we'll do though is going to be, I mentioned when we were at 125,000, that was a million over eight. And we can even simplify that number, pretend that the M that they use to mean times a thousand uh, means the number, or times a million. Even though M in the prefixes is not a million, it, mil is thousand in the prefixes, but the M now is like million. It, that type of M that means million divided by eight, we could say equals 125,000. So we will have to do an M over seven subscriber special because one seventh of a million rounded down is 142,857. That's the decimal chain that you get when you do one seventh and two sevenths and stuff where if you take one seventh, it's 0.142857 repeating forever. And if you do two sevenths, it's that string slid down a little and has these interesting cyclic properties. And so we'll be looking at the weirdness of one seventh in about 2000 subscribers. So, you know, I'll be doing a special then. There will also be probably an episode. If not an episode, I'll do a live stream, but probably an, a whole episode coming out on, this isn't the next episode, this is in a few weeks, but we're almost at the 30 year anniversary of Fermat's last theorem first being solved. Now there was some updates to it like a year after that that fixed a mini error, but it was there was a first announcement and presentation that it was like, okay, this thing's basically cracked. And it was a question from hundreds of years ago. And so it's about time for the 30 year anniversary of that being solved to go into first half of the episode's gonna be the interesting history. There's this cryptic margin note in a notebook, hundreds of years of mystery, um, a secluded mathematician cracking this crate, well not secluded person, but his research on it was all in private, cracking this crazy thing. And I mean, it, his research built on a lot of other people's math, but he didn't want to tell anybody that he was close to cracking this age old mystery until he was pretty sure. And he, until he like presented it and there's, I want to go into the first half of the episode, the history leading up to that. 
the second half of the episode, what similar questions remain that aren't solved yet? You know, you can't add two cubes to another cube, according to Fermat's last theorem, but you can add three cubes to another cube. Uh, we don't know if you can add how many nth powers it takes to add to another nth power. So there's sort of like an extension to it, which also goes back to an age old theorem. In this case, I can, well, no, age old conjecture that was wrong. In this case, the great Euler will have to be quoted as being wrong about a conjecture. Don't worry, we'll mention he was the greatest mathematician ever. When you prove thousands of things and you make so many conjectures, you're also going to make a few conjectures that didn't turn out to be true. It was a logical conjecture, one I probably would have guessed myself if I had been in that state of knowledge and research, but it wasn't true, but we don't know exactly the extent to which it wasn't true. So the second half of whatever episode I do about Fermat's last theorem, even if you already know the history for some reason, uh, we're going to go into what questions remain. The other episode that will definitely be coming out this month, like I mentioned, is, or almost definitely is a more thorough explanation of the cool new aperiodic monotile shapes that dropped. Now, and there's some other ones that I've planned, so, you know, a lot of fun stuff coming. Now, somebody asked if 478, their subcount, has any special properties. And, you know, that's normally I won't randomly answer somebody's that personal question in the chat. But if it's a random number to look up, we'll usually will look it up for fun. I like looking up random numbers. And the two easiest places to do that are see this exact site is one of them, the OEIS. We can see if it's in any sequences. And then we can just see if Wikipedia has anything to say about it, because Wikipedia has facts about some numbers. And... First, let's see if 478, I'm not going to do this for everybody's subscriber count, but uh, this will be an example of how to look up fun numbers. Uh, it is the number of partitions of 26 that do not contain the number one in their partition. Now, it's also probably other stuff. It's twice a prime. It's called a companion Pell number. So there's a lot of good stuff like that. And if we go on Wikipedia too, let's pull up something there. We'll go to 487. Or was it 470? No, 478. Sorry, did I? Was that the, was I searching 478 or 487? Maybe I searched the wrong one. Uh, 478. Not the year. We want the number. Where do we get the number? Okay. Maybe they don't have it. Or do the year. Okay. They don't have that. So we have to go to 400. So here's what you do if they don't have the exact page. You go to the nearest round number under it. And they might be like, no, not the year. Uh, we want... This will give us some facts about the range. So like 487 might have a fact over here. Um, or no, 478, the one. Okay, they're talking about how it's these facts. Twice a prime. Okay, wait, there, oh my God. It's the exact three facts that I quoted from the OEIS. These are the exact three facts. Twice a prime, companion Pell number, number of partitions of 26 that don't contain one. Whoa. So... You see, the OEIS and Wikipedia will often agree on what the first fact to mention about it is. But that's funny how close they line up right there. So. Cool. Somebody said they posted about base 120 on Reddit about representing fractions. Uh, feel free to post any cool thoughts on the combo class subreddit, too. I will check there this weekend along with I'll check through my emails and stuff. But I do actually use Reddit more than I use Discord apart. Not necessarily the combo class one. I like the combo class Discord a lot. But that's the only one I use for that app. So I'm going to start using the combo class subreddit more and posting a few random things there too. So remember that that exists. And if you post something there, I will check it at some point. So somebody also asked a bit ago about when I said about Apple experiments that could I do an Apple DNA experiment? 
Possibly. I don't know how I will test the DNA, but it's a good thought. I don't have anything like a microscope here, or DNA tester necessarily, but perhaps we can. A um, lot of interesting science things we can do as eventually maybe I will have the budget to, you know, like randomly buy a microscope if I want one for an episode or something. Not there yet, but we'll find cool things to do sciency with apples and other things as well. So, um, somebody asked what I do for a living, and I was a private teacher of music lessons and math lessons until not long ago, but I stopped that, well, I had a chaotic few years. I had to get two crazy surgeries last year, and I almost died the year before that. So. There's been little periods over the past few years where I was unable to do any work, uh, where I was like in the hospital and stuff. But throughout that, I was mostly a private teacher of music and math lessons. And I stopped that pretty recently because I want to focus on my, uh, my videos as well as writing and stuff that I do. And so I still live at my parents' house, so I don't make enough from combo class to say pay rent somewhere even, but I do make enough from combo class to hire people a few days a week to film with me and to sometimes buy cool props and science stuff and to overall, you know, create the videos I'm currently creating, which will improve over time as we have more budget. But now that I am making some money from combo class, although it's not enough to like say pay rent or anything somewhere, I have stopped my music teaching to focus on this as of just a few months ago, as of what I call grade negative two, essentially. So somebody's noting one cube plus five cube plus three cubed is 153. Yes, I think that may have shown up in a fact of mine in a short possibly, um, but there, Interesting numbers you can limit by raising their digits to powers. Another notable one around there, if we're adding cubes, you know how I said that um, you can't add two cubes to another cube, but you can add three? Now, something that I know, this is not really a spoiler because this is just the tip of the iceberg, but one identity that more people need to know about is, I bet like half of you know about this, but the fact that half of you don't is criminal and this needs to be more well known. So you know how three squared plus four squared equals five squared is like the simplest two whole numbers that you can add squares to get another whole number squared. It makes it the simplest right triangle with whole numbers for sides. And it turns out to be basically the seed triangle that you can use to create all the right triangles. It's like the root at the beginning of this tree. So that is a really important combo of squares right there. Really important identity that I'm sure you know. But did you know this like older cousin of it? Three cubed plus four cubed plus five cubed equals, wait for it, Yes, six cubed. I don't know why more people don't know about that like older brother version of it. No, you cannot continue it to fourth powers. So there are still mysteries about what works and what doesn't. But not only can you add three cubes to make another if you allow extra numbers in the thing, but the smallest example of it is beautiful and looks like that. So, man. Nah. But that is what we'll go into when we do a Fermat's Last Theorem episode, is what do we currently know about how many of a certain power you can add to get another? Like, can you add three fifth powers to make another? Well, maybe you can add four fifth powers to make another. Is there a pattern? The great mathematician Euler had a conjecture a while ago that was proven wrong. So if you think about this and you make some conjectures, don't be too shocked if the logical guess you might guess isn't actually the case. In fact, the counterexample to Euler's thing, I think I might have made a short about this a while ago. The counterexample to Euler's conjecture 
was at the time and still in under some standards, but especially at the time, the shortest proof that had ever been published. It was like one sentence. It's like, we have found a counterexample to this conjecture of Euler, which had said this, and the counterexample is this. And it was like, that's worth publishing as a paper because it was like disproving this age old conjecture of the greatest mathematician of all time, but it only took them one sentence. So that itself could be a fun topic someday, you know, shortest versus longest proofs. Now the longest is probably going to be awarded to the classification of finite simple groups which is more than 10,000 pages and has more than 100 authors and took dozens of years. <laughs> so thank you to everyone who says nice stuff and whoever asked what writing I do. I've always been a writer of a variety of things and I haven't published much of it, if ever, uh, much. So, uh, a lot of my writing is buried in computer documents and paper notebooks, but it ranges from math related, my version of a textbooks that I want to write to fictional worlds that are sort of mysterious little webs of stories that I hope to tell before too long. And although those, the more fictional ones are not a textbook in the sense that don't read it for the goal of mastering a particular subject. They will include a lot of fun little mathematical things uh, between little math things that you may have not thought of before that you'll encounter to things that like, if you already know a math concept from my episodes, you may see a deeper structure behind some things that are going on and some of the patterns or things that are put together. So they will be quite mathematical for those who like that. But a lot of the stories I hope to publish, I will make an update about that before long. Like I said, I might just go into releasing some of them before long because it's a whole web of uh, interesting connections. They will almost be like a choose your own adventure, but not in the sense of picking the plot, in the sense of picking what part of it you look at next. So, to whoever said cool scenery, we do have all our lovely clocks, and we even have new stuff that's like growing all out of these trees. This tree is going crazy with all those new growths. This one's going kind of crazy. The potato plant's doing good. This is a potato. Just potato growing, and clocks fell on it, sorry. Um, but, and the flies do like this potato. It's like attracting flies or something, so I'm going to have to work on that. But I like the potato. It's cool. And then that has some random growth coming out of it. So random growth all over. Also, I don't know if you folks saw in my last episode that I put out yesterday, but there was two shots of squirrels. And one of them went by pretty quick because I didn't know what context to put it in. I, I'll probably share the whole longer clips of the squirrels on like Patreon or something, but I try and sneak little bits of them into the episodes. And there's a really cute one where a squirrel was right over there eating some bird seed I had left it. I sprinkled some bird seed there and it was just like there, like nibbling, looking at me. And it was really close. There are these younger squirrels that are really playful and they're more trustworthy of humans. And we're probably going to get more squirrel cameos this grade, as well as more double squirrel cameos where they're playing together. Uh, somebody asked if I've worked with computer programming, and I haven't worked with it too much myself. I do want to, in fact, work with more programmers. I've talked to some, but um, I'm not always the best with digital communication, doing stuff like that. I work better one-on-one -on -one with people, but I do have to link up more digitally with various programmers who are out there, because I have a lot of ideas that would be pretty quick to test, but while I will at some point learn how to run really simple stuff on programming, because I understand the logic behind it. I just don't know any particular softwares. Um, it's not going to be something I master in my life. I'm, I like sort of old fashioned stuff. Um, like when I say that, I don't mean that I am like adamantly anti-technology or anything. 
And in fact, many of like my personal beliefs aren't really like old fashioned in any way you'd say, but I like being surrounded by real world stuff, whether it's, you know, my old broken growing stuff or whatever. And so I'm not going to be the guy who masters programming and computer modeling and stuff. I do want to work with more people like that and feel free to reach out to me or bug me if you have reached out to me in the past at the email that's in the description here to anyone who wants to make visualizations or things like that for any particular things. I would like to incorporate more little animations and things like that in my episodes. And if I ever include something from one of my viewers, I would certainly credit them when it pops up. And so I don't really, I like homemade stuff more and I'm more likely to put in an animation if it was made by one of my viewers, like for combo class then I would pull a random thing from online and credit a random person. So we'll see. In the last episode, I did a lot of drawings myself. I also like drawing things myself for the simpler things to visualize, but that's more for the teaching purpose than for the like trying to figure something out about numbers purpose. So feel free to reach out if people uh, want to animate any random stuff. And how many squirrels are there? It's hard to say, because they live in a variety of yards around here. They scamper around. I think they live in a redwood tree that's in a neighbor's yard, but they come all the way around the different yards, snacking and hanging and stuff. And I have seen up to three at a time. So I, I don't know how many there are. There's probably more than three, but I've seen up to three in the same place at the same time. I assume there's more because recently I've seen two or three young looking ones and I think their parents are still around somewhere. So I think we got at least one whole family there. Somebody mentioned, uh, have I thought about solving foreign exam problems for fun? And that could be fun. I could look into that at some point. I maybe on this channel, cause I do see this to a degree, like my bonus channel, I'd go through some exam problems, but those, can verge on being boring content if you don't uh, spin it into a deeper topic or how it relates to stuff. You can do it well. Like, for example, there's one or two videos on the channel 3 Blue One Brown that's a really good channel that are just based on a test problem, but that he goes into a deeper context of, you know, how the trying to solve this problem reveals a lot about different aspects of math or aspects of ability to solve problems or things. There are other channels where a lot of their videos are, here's a problem. Here's another problem. Here's another problem. Here's how you solve it. I find those boring. That's not the type of video I watch. So I'm not that likely to do something that's just like, here are three exam problems. Here is how you solve them. However, if I, few people can feel free to suggest exam problems they think are cool. If I think a particular problem ties into a bigger subject in a cool way, or that there's like a cool analogy or story we could make for how you'd want to solve the problem, then I would consider using that as, you know, the, as one of the overarching threads or like narratives for something like a certain question. I, I personally like the questions since there's plenty of them that are those age old historical questions like Fermat's last theorem. Cause I'm just getting started on the episodes I want to make that involve here's a cool unsolved thing. That's surprisingly simple, but unknown. There's a lot of those in my notes still to show. And a few of the upcoming episodes are sort of like that. The last one was like, here's a mystery about graph theory. The next one will likely be the one that's like, here is a recently solved mystery about tilings. And then the, one of the other ones I was talking about is like, here's a mystery that was solved 30 years ago. But although that one was 30 years ago from Ma's last theorem, it's like the same ratio of how long the problem has been thought about till when it was solved practically, because it's more than 300 years old. Although I guess people have probably been trying to tile things for a long time too. So, Somebody asked if I have an origin story of the clocks. Uh, I tell a version of where the story was at that includes some of the intro about half a year ago on the Combo Class channel. There's an episode called Clock Quest that tells a bit of the story. So you can look at that. Um, it's on the Combo Class channel. 
I'll make an update at some point of the clock quest where we go into more details about what it means. I do have some clock related episodes planned before long. We are going to do one that dives into other ways we could write the numbers on a clock. Like even if you do keep 12 numbers in 60 minutes, other ways we could write it or other ways we could interpret it. We'll also have a lot more clocks whenever we talk about modular arithmetic. Clocks also will have interesting philosophical ramifications as we uh, see patterns in our grades becoming other grades. Uh, we are in grade negative two right now, for those who don't know, and we will, there'll be a somewhere around one negative grade we deepen to per year, not exactly, maybe about once a year. We will deepen to the next grade when the time is right. For example, the time was right after grade negative one when it was about to be April and spring was about to hit and it was time to put out the 36th episode on the main combo class channel. And that marked one zero zero in base six. And someday humans will hopefully switch to base six. And then when they describe combo class in that era, uh, they'll write that there was like one zero zero main episodes in grade negative one because that's how they'll write 36. We'll probably have more than 36 in grade negative two though, because we'll probably be at 36 episodes before a year's up and I'll probably be like, we have a little more to achieve in grade negative two. Let's go to 48 or something. We'll see. Now somebody's saying like a periodic monotiling and yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. There was new and newer news about it. I mentioned it as it like right after it dropped in my last stream, but I saw it in the newspaper today too. It's getting public coverage because it's an easier to describe question that was cracked. And so we are going to do it. Cause I already someday was going to do an episode about what was called Penrose tiling, which does a similar thing with two tiles and the mono tile in the name here refers to the fact that they've gotten it down to one tile. However, they, there was an exception or a limit to how good their last mono tile was, the one that dropped a few months ago. And just a week ago, they dropped the new mono tiles. So I feel obligated to make that episode to figure out a good, thorough explanation of it for people who will probably be looking it up in the next week and being like, what's up with those mono tiles? I actually filmed the intro to that episode, but just like the first scene. So just to have ready in case it's the next one I film, but I'm filming again tomorrow with my main guy, Carlo. So likely that tomorrow I will film, you know, up to the halfway point or so of my aperiodic monotile episode that typically my episodes on the main combo class channel are about a week apart. In the future future, when I have a good team assembled, we will have one out every six days on that channel. I think that would be great because I love the number six and because it would be kind of funny to have it switch days. Each episode it goes back a day, kind of. So uh, in the future, when I have a whole team, new main episode every six days. But for now, uh, this month, it might be more like 10 days. It's also one reason why uh, this month might have like one or two less days, one or two less videos compared to normal, which doesn't mean that much. That means like, you know, instead of dropping like 30 pieces of content, I might drop like 20 this month, partially because some of them will be longer and they're topics I really want to get right. And partially because this month, I'm not going to say exactly when, but this month's my birthday and I'm turning 30. And so there's going to be a couple days out of the month where I am not working on math and I am just having a meditational reset of sorts. And so, or partying with my friends, although I might try and rope my friends into filming a cameo for one of my snack break episodes. So we'll see. But because this month is my birthday as well as other birthdays in my family, uh, there's gonna be a few days where I'm not working on my combo class. Probably barely any days because I love working on combo class. Some people are worried that like, why do I stream so much? It's going to burn me out or something. Don't worry. It's the other way around. I feel I have plenty of anxiety and depression for sure, but I have a lot less of that when I'm working on combo class. 
So working on combo class fills in my days in a good way. It's a job I enjoy. So I, I probably won't stick to my promise to take any days off, but it, it's hard to say what uh, constitutes work for it anyway, because there's sort of a blurred line between if I'm studying a math book, do I consider that like I'm working for the show? If I'm taking notes about the math book, does that turn it into I'm now working or not? If, you know, like if I'm filming random squirrels out here that might make it in an episode, uh, it's sort of a blurred line in my life of which things are working toward combo class or not, but I certainly love spending a lot of time on it. And this month, it is the sixth month as well. So that's interesting too. Now, let's see. We have a few other fun things we could get up to in this stream. Let's see what other topics could be neat. Well, I do need to run inside for a moment to really quickly not only go pee, but also I want to grab a few nuts for the squirrels because last time I was out here, I put some nuts up there that are gone now. So unless the wind went crazy or something, at some point the squirrel came by, saw a good nut right there and enjoyed it. And so maybe they'll get the sense when I drop another nut. These young ones are really brave. They'll go pretty close to me. So I've gotten a lot of footage of them recently. It's really good that, like I said, maybe I'll stick like an extended cut someday either on here or on the Patreon, but I try and tuck a few squirrels into each episode if I can get them while I'm filming. If my goal is always while I'm filming that they'll run by while I'm saying one of the lines of the episode, but uh, sometimes we get different types. We got a squirrel knocked over a clock not long ago. They're getting brave. They're doing fun stuff, but they're my allies. You see, uh, yeah, we're going to have an alliance with the squirrels. Before long, we'll have one on the desk eating a nut while we're teaching. So let's think of a fun challenge or activity here. Um, for while I go there. Um, well, I'll just be quick. I'll grab the nut, go to the bathroom real quick. I'm going to be back in like three minutes. Now, everybody, leave a comment with... Whatever cool animal you would like us to hopefully see in the future. What wild animal do you hope wanders through the classroom? And if it doesn't, maybe we can go on a hike to find it. All right, I'll be back soon.
All right, combo lords. So, thank you to all of my lords who stuck around and to anyone who pops back in momentarily. Somebody said there were chipmunks that would eat peanuts from their hands. Now, I did look it up and I was wondering how safe it would be for me to try and feed a squirrel from my hand. And it appears that there is a chance that squirrels could carry a disease that would be bad, but that they very rarely bite. So it looked like if a squirrel bit me, I would need to go get a checkup and make sure I didn't get like tetanus or something, but that it would be unlikely a squirrel would bite me. So I think I'm gonna go for it. Once, you know, they're a little closer, I'll try and feed them out of my hand or something. That will be a great shot. Just wait until one of these episodes is going to start with, Hey folks, welcome back to combo class. Well, one of them's eating out of my hand. Now, somebody asked if I got the uh, 100K plaque. I did. I opened that on a stream a while ago and it's hanging on my indoor wall. So if I leave it out here, it'll be fully destroyed soon. But the 100K plaque for this channel will be visible if we stream in my room. Uh, which we will do at times. That's, you know, if it's ever too dark out here and I don't want to deal with that, or sometimes if, when it's raining, for sure, we will be in my room at some points in the future. And I think I will, I'll consider doing some crazy experiment where we like destroy the plaque or leave it out here, or something or another, once I get the other one for my combo class channel. Cause we still need to build that combo class channel up. It's at like one fifth of this size even though they're probably similar in power because those subscribers all, not all of them, but a lot of those people like watch every video with the notifications. A lot of the people here are like saw like 10 shorts they liked. Who knows how comboed up they'll get in the future. We'll see. You know, well, over time, the people who have seen me here and there on the shorts, it'll get this image in their brain that like, okay, there's this weird guy in the lab coat with the clocks talking about the math. Then when they see me again, you know how you like familiar stuff, like it or not? That's why advertisements work, uh, where it's like Coca-Cola, and then you see it and you're like, I guess Coca-Cola is the one I've heard of. Uh, well, not that I'm gonna advertise, but that being on the shorts page will hopefully be like an advertisement of my face to the younger generation who uses that page especially. And then when they are on YouTube, Someday they'll see some of those horizontal videos and they'll click those and they'll learn a lot more than the shorts. Shorts are cool, but get a deeper thing with the horizontal ones. Now, somebody says, what's this property? A whole number A squared is X. Now, A plus one time. Okay, be careful. You're using X as times and as a variable. I think you mean A plus one times A minus one and not another X in there uh, is... Do you mean x squared minus one? I think what you mean is that the difference of squares identity. So uh, I actually, one of the shorts that's linked in the description here on the combo class channel is a visual proof of that, that I did with some pieces of paper. But yeah, if you uh, x squared minus y squared equals x plus y times x minus y. Now, Lots of cool thoughts in the comments. Let's leave a few nuts in the back for the squirrels. I got some for myself as well. They especially like are like walnuts and pecans and stuff. And so we're gonna unsalted. If you ever feed the squirrel, yeah, it salts bad for them. It dries them up. So let's give them some uh, unsalted nuts. Now, what I do is I try and leave them a little path. So like. One up there, and then one down here, so they might want to come a little lower, and then we'll put one right there. They're good little climbers, they'll get it and be safe. So, now, more chance the squirrel might run by the background, you never know. Just because they do like it also, we're gonna give them a little treat. They help us out with a lot of cameos. We'll also sprinkle a little bird seed again back there. Last time, that was when it stopped and was like nibbling and just like watching me and nibbling right next to me was when I put some bird seed over here. Okay. Now those squirrels got enough treats. 
So, um, um, now, leave any more thoughts. We're in the chiller portion of the stream, and I'm probably going to wrap up before too long because we've already done most of our mathematical concepts, but some things to look forward to are... Uh, now, while it's summer, we will be doing some fun random little snack breaks and stuff on this channel, little botany analysis and stuff. And as far as the math episode's coming, it's going to be a sort of shapey month. There's a few of the topics I plan to ha have sort of visual demonstrations of different sorts. And there's even another topic, the one I'm planning after that might involve shapey stuff as well. Often we can get numbers out of shapes, and I go so far down the number rabbit hole. In fact, most of my future math episodes are number themed, but we're going to be doing a little shapey stuff for a little bit. Now, some of that is like geometry. Other of that is like the visualizations of graph theory we did last time and other geometric or other sorts of things. Um, some other things that will be upcoming in the streams are... I didn't plan a particular day. I'll be live every day this month. It'll be a little more scattered which days it is. However, I'm going to try and schedule them when possible for some of the fun streams that are like some random cool event or topic a uh, day in advance. I'm not always on top of doing that. Sometimes just a few hours before. But sometimes I'll try and schedule them in advance so you can see them coming. And I also notify on the Discord often when they're about to happen. And some of these streams coming forward uh, I will be probably uh, having Carlo, my main camera guy, stick around and help me run the tech on a few of them. And not only will it, you know, you can get to meet one of my main camera people a little more, but more so I will be able to deliver much better streams when... Oh, the squirrel's over there. Maybe it'll come back and check out those nuts. I'll be able to deliver much better streams when I'm not simultaneously worried about the technology aspect of it. I'll be able to just have a cool list of plans and stuff and not worry about messing up which, if I'm showing the screen when it's not supposed to or if I'm making audio come through or stuff. Like in fact, right here, I have like one of the, I have the audio accidentally turned on on this thing. If I had accidentally opened the wrong thing, it would have like double layered the audio and I wouldn't have noticed. So, like happened not long ago. So uh, I am going to try and expand and get a little more help on technological aspects. Some of that does include, although I'm bad at digital uh, reaching out to people sometimes, I don't like checking my email that much, but I will get back to a lot of people who have emailed me. So if you are in that group, um, thank you for all of the reaching out and I'll make sure to check through those more thoroughly this weekend. And incorporate some things like uh, people who want to make more visuals or test random numerical experiments here or other thoughts. You know, if you are an extra combo lord and want to find random ways to help out, you can always reach out as well. Or if you happen to be around the Bay Area and want to help, uh, you can always especially reach out and maybe I can use your help in the combo classroom. Now, we also will possibly, I want to try taking some more fun little field trips where I want to try and bring a little whiteboard out to other natural locations while it's going to be the beautiful summer. But I don't know if I'm going to be able to take a live stream anywhere due to uh, the service and connection and internet and such. So I might have to do some bonus videos instead of live streams for some of those vibes that are field trips to some cool locations that I especially places that I love and I know are beautiful and interesting in nature that I haven't been able to visit for years because of some crazy stuff that happened in the past few years. But now we are back in action and able to do cool stuff like that. And now I will have extra motivation to bring a little whiteboard and film a cool scene in our rare locations. Now, like I said, before long, there will also be writing stuff and musical stuff coming out from me. So 
you know, beware that once in a while you will see other sides, mostly in the form of written things or musical things that will come out on this channel or from Demotro in some form. But if you ever get bored of that and you just want your pure learning, there's always the combo class channel. And that's about all of the topics that I needed to discuss right now. So I think I'm going to actually log off for now. We got a miniature squirrel cameo, but I'll make sure that if I'm out here editing or whatever and some cool ones run by, I film them and maybe put together a little bonus video of like squirrel footage and commentary or something sometime. Got some good squirrel clips. I also got, well, I only put this on the Patreon so far because I couldn't find room in an episode yet, but I'll try and put it somewhere. There's a skunk came in the classroom. That one's not as good. Big ol' skunk. So I got footage of that too. I'll see what that ends up in. Maybe I'll make a short or something. <laughs> so also if we look at the front yard while it's blooming in the summer, we're going to get so many nice birds. So love you all so much. Make sure you've seen the new combo class episode about Ramsey numbers. If you missed some of the stream, I will add some timestamps later today. Uh, sometime before it's like processed with the HD and chat and stuff. Although it is always available right away in SD if you just want to watch it then. You can also catch me on the Discord or Patreon and subreddit, like we said, and other cool things like that. So June is my favorite month. There's going to be a lot of cool things coming. And although, like I said, I'm not promising which specific days things will come, stay tuned for a lot of combo learning and a lot of fun combo natural existence and other fun things.